everybody. Welcome to Jubilee Circle. I am Candace Shalou. See, I have to pause. <laughs> You're having a discussion about how my name could run together if you say Candace Shalou. Who knows? Who knows what my name is? So I'm Candace Shalou. I am the spiritual director here at Jubilee Circle, and this is our first of hopefully many uh, Jubilee Circle in conversation meetings where we are going to invite uh, folks from our community who are of different faith traditions uh, so they can tell us a little bit more and educate us about their faith tradition and so we can learn um, about the great diversity um, in faith traditions that we have represented here in the Columbia area. And welcome to everyone who is joining us uh, as we stream live on YouTube. We are happy to have you joining us virtually for uh, tonight's conversation. And tonight's conversation is uh, with Holly Emore. And Holly is um, a, a very dear friend of mine. She has been my friend for years. Oh. <laughs> She has been my friend for many years, and she uh, did a house blessing for me, and uh, I was at her ordination, and um, coming up pretty soon, she's going to do a wedding ceremony for me. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. She <laughs> preached at my ordination. It was awesome. <laughs> and uh, I don't even remember how we met, Holly. I really I can't either. don't. <laughs> I can't either. I'm just glad we did. It's like we've known each other forever, so we're just going to go with that. Okay. Uh, but I would just uh, like to uh, get, I want to know a little more about you. So uh, you have a presentation that you're going to show us, and we have that sort of that infinity effect going on. Oh, look, <laughs> look at that. that. Yeah. <laughs> well. So we're going to run her presentation uh, live. So uh, there you go. So we get to see ourselves <laughs> in many, many echoes. Uh, my friend Lee would call this fractals. Yeah. See what's yeah. happening there. <laughs> so... But tell me a little bit about your background. Um, I remember years ago you were you were afraid to say that you were a pagan, and now here you are, <laughs> out of the closet, out of the broom closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it took me a long time to get here, and uh, for a while I was self-employed, and that's a little dicey around here. You know, people don't have to give you a contract. But mm -hmm. I grew up Lutheran, was raised good, solid. LCA, and uh, somewhere along the way, I used to go to the synagogue with my best friend, and uh, I, I visited lots of places, hung out with the Presbyterian some, and then when I was about 15 and a half, that sort of, I call it the hippie Jesus movement, <laughs> swept across the country, and I got caught up in that, and it was just so different from the way I'd been raised, and I, now I have a, a real appreciation for all of that experience. But it was, you know, it was a little bit mystical. And um, we loved each other so much. It was so fun. It was a lot like Jubilee. <laughs> <laughs> so I was involved in that. And, you know, it began to kind of get a little more straight-laced yeah. over the years. And after I uh, uh, got spit out of an ugly divorce about uh, age 30, I moved to Columbia hung with the Unitarians for a while. I was a member of MCC, which is now Garden of Grace, mm -hmm. for a few years. And then I finally mm -hmm. said, you know, I've, I know I'm pagan. I've known it for several years now, and I love you guys. I felt more welcomed there than I had ever felt before anywhere. But, you know, and I still remember Mike Hughes yep. telling me, you know, Holly, we love having you sing for us. I used to sing a lot. but. You need to do whatever you need to do for yourself. And it was like he blessed me. He told me later, I didn't know you were going to leave the choir. <laughs> <laughs> he never would have said it if he knew you were leaving the choir. <laughs> I know, I know. So anyway, I, I went on. And over the years, uh, ended up, uh, you know, I sojourned, as we say, with different folks. But I have my own group now. We sort of formed our own tradition, much like you all did with Jubilee. And our particular tradition is based on ancient Egypt. That's here in town. It's just a small group of us. So we're what's called Kemetic, but uh, the term paganism covers a whole lot more than that. So we'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay. I got my Master of Divinity from uh, Cherry Hill Seminary, which I now serve as Executive Director. So that's been an exciting adventure. That's quite quite the adventure. And so, and so that's the connection. It was, it was Garden of Grace. It was the MCC. So, because I, I was the associate pastor at Garden of Grace for 
six yes. years. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. That was that would that would be the connection right there. Yeah, I think you and I kind of yeah passed. <laughs> passed in the night, but yeah, yeah but we, we got reconnected. Um, tell me a, tell me a minute about Cherry Hill Seminary. I think people are surprised to learn that there is a pagan seminary. There is indeed. Really, some people will use the word seminary, but to our knowledge, excuse me. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Cherry Hill Seminary is the only actual graduate program uh, that offers a Master of Divinity, in, actually in several departments. And um, we're all distance ed. We occasionally have intensives uh, together. We haven't done that, obviously, for about three, almost three years mm. now. Right. Uh, but we do, we've been on uh, first uh, Skype and then Zoom for, oh gosh, 10 Skype. years now. Yeah, I remember wow. Skype. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, online classrooms. So we were doing that before Harvard was. Yeah. And uh, because we're all distance ed, I am so fortunate that I get to have really well-known, established scholars and just interesting people. Uh, I don't know how many of you are public radio listeners, but Margot Adler was on our advisory board. Wow. Yeah, people like that. Vivian Crowley, I don't know if you've ever heard yes, of her. Phyllis yes. Carat, who chaired the Parliament of the World's Religions recently. So it's been really wonderful for this small town girl from Gastonia, North Carolina. <laughs> wow. Uh, to I was born in Greensboro, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two North Carolina girls. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So that's a little about me. That's great, Holly. And thank you for joining us. I, you know, oh, I talked to you. you about us starting this, and you were like, I'll be the guinea pig. <laughs> and so I'm so <laughs> appreciative that you stepped forward oh, and agreed to be our first, our first one up at, at bat. Um, and I, I want to give you enough uh, time to uh, talk to us about paganism. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. you. Um, and uh, Jim will run your slides for you, mm -hmm. and so you can uh, give us... Some, edu some education this evening. So, okay, good. So I'm going to stand up then, and I'll just point to you when I want to move forward. And I didn't say that I also served for 10 years on the board of Interfaith Partners of South Carolina, yes. and I hope by now you all know who that is, <laughs> and I hope to see you at an event in the near future, because right now most of our events are online. But there's also a festival in Irmo that started out with us. It's uh, All Day Sunday um, in the Irmo City Park, the Irmo International Festival. So, this is me. <laughs> um, that's on top of uh, some mountains, I've forgotten, but it's, it's like uh, east of San Francisco, whatever that range is, I've forgotten now, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we had cougars leaving footprints outside our your door. Um, we don't go quite that back to nature now, but you can go ahead. But I like to introduce paganism by saying it, it's about the, our world, our beautiful world. And today, being Earth Day, is just such a perfect time. Do you want me to adjust this in some way? Okay. Okay, good. So just to give you some idea, it's very hard to say how many people are in some groups because they're informal. For example, it's really hard to count the number of Jews in America because somebody may consider themselves ethnically or by descent Jewish, but they don't belong to a synagogue. So all anybody can count is memberships at synagogues. But there were either five or eight million dollars, eight million, excuse me, Jews in 2020, um, the last study in 2020 showed three and a half million Muslims, and that is actually the fastest growing religion in America right now. Uh, 14 million Southern Baptists. AME, African Methodist Episcopal, is a big denomination. The, actually, the, um, the largest population of AME members is in South Carolina, uh, but it's a big Southeastern um, denomination, so a million. Uh, Three million Lutherans, and this is, for those of you who know the difference, this is just ELCA. Uh, Twelve million United Methodists. Pagans are even harder to count because, well, for one thing, nobody knows how to find us, unfortunately, or fortunately, as, as you may feel. But 
it could be one to two million in this country. So who the heck are these people and what are they doing out there? That's a maypole, of course. Well, in South Carolina, pagans come from all walks of life. I bet I don't have to tell you this, but sometimes when I do a presentation, it helps for people to hear that, yeah, most of us are registered to vote, and many, many, many pagans have served or serve in the military, lots. In fact, there's a whole um, worldwide organization called Sacred Well Congregation that endorses clergy, and they're approved by the Department of Defense. Go ahead. I just like this picture because I think it it's kind of puts me in mind of the Jubilee logo, that uh, everything is a lie. So, so how did we get here? Paganism is not an ancient religion, okay? There were some mythical things that happened, uh, like urban myth uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, but this, po this point of view and this thinking about things. Hi, I know you guys, hey. Uh, I like to point out this picture by Gauguin. Paul Gauguin was a um, late 19th, early 20th century artist who abandoned his wife and 12 or 13 kids in France and went off to Tahiti where he found naked women, fruit, a lot of sunshine, you know, if they'd had umbrella drinks then, he probably could have had some of those. So he was kind of mesmerized by this, and he found out that these people were not Christian. Ooh. But they were happy. They got along fine. They had sex, and they didn't feel the need to apologize for it. Um, they even had, ooh, idols. So why weren't they being struck dead? Well... So, and interestingly, I won't try to tell you the French, but the translation of the title is, where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? So this kind of summed up how people began to think about things, actually probably going back to the 1700s, but particularly in the late 1800s. And you had um, circulating these classical texts from antiquity that got rediscovered during the Renaissance and collected, and they began to kind of leak out into society. And people thought, well, if it's old, it must be wise. It's got to be closer to the origin of the truth. Uh, and some of those writings are, are referred to as hermetic, and so we had this idea of hermeticism. Also, secret societies. I couldn't understand this for a long time until I did some reading about uh, British culture and society, and it turns out that in the 1800s and early 1900s, something like 89% of English working adults belonged to a secret society because it was their trade union. They really did, they really did have secret handshakes. <laughs> it was because they needed to protect their trade. So people were accustomed to this idea that we now think of as like Masonic temple rituals and things. And then you had Victorian, um, suddenly everybody wanted to collect folklore. And they were fascinated with what they thought of as the noble savage, which of course is a very colonialist and racist idea. But the good thing that came out of it was that people went out and started uh, visiting cultures and people and places all over the world. They tried to collect folklore and stories. So this became a big deal uh, in the late 19th century. Now, roots of modern paganism. Is there anything I should s not step towards? Oh, you're fine. Okay. I don't know. We've got the light. We've got to figure out the inside. Okay. Uh, this is actually Woodstock. Um, I see some of you that may share a certain age group with me, and you may remember, in fact, uh, Tamara and I were talking earlier, I found a book back there that came out of the, the old commune, I think it was called The Farm in Tennessee, and I got that the year it came out. That's a first edition back there, folks. I still have mine, and that influenced me so much. I thought that I shouldn't wear makeup, I should wear mus unbleached muslin and blue jeans, and 
get back to the land and learn herbalism. All of these things were part of that late 60s uh, ethos that was building up. So we were just ripe in America. We had the environmental movement, first Earth Day, and let's see, my eighth grade. I was the only person that came to class with buttons and little <laughs> poster thingies, and people thought I was crazy, but that was nothing new. Uh, so all that counterculture, a lot of disillusionment with organized religion. It was becoming passe to just belong to your parents' religion. We were asking a lot of questions. And the rise of feminism was a huge influence here, and uh, there has been a lot of it in England as well. So you had people begin to say, why is it that God has to be male? I, that has nothing to do with me. So the rise of the feminist movement led to what we often call the goddess movement. Now, this fellow, Gerald Gardner, lived in the turn of the last century. He published a book, I think in 1947 or something, it was a novel, but it basically taught people how to be witches in the guise of fiction because it was still illegal in England to be a witch. You could still be arrested and put in prison. With the repeal of the witchcraft laws about three years later, he began to publish books and he, he started initiating people as fast as he could. <clears throat> and a lot of those came to America. Now, about that same time, well, no, earlier than that, this woman named Margaret Murray, has anybody heard of Margaret Murray? Yeah. <laughs> she was a good Egyptologist, but she took a sabbatical and for some reason she decided suddenly that she was gonna write books about this ancient, matrilineal, matriarchal, continuous witch cult in Europe that went back to prehistoric times. Well, it's a lovely myth, but it's totally made up. We have absolutely no evidence that that was ever true. And of course, if it was prehistoric, that means it was prehistory, get it? Um, so we don't really know, but I understand that a lot of people that are right about my age or a little bit older actually had to read Margaret Murray coming through high school. So a lot of people were exposed to this idea and you'll still hear it said that people, there had been witches all through um, Europe's development and through the Crusades and through the, um, the witch burnings and all of this thing. The truth is that most of the people who were uh, executed as witches. It, it had more to do with money and property than it did with religion because they were all Christian anyway. Okay. So, what do we believe? Well, most pagans will tell you it's not so much about what we believe. It's more about um, practice. But that said, we all have our own ideas about things. You will not. There is no creed. There's no hierarchy um, like a pope or a bishop that tells everybody else um, what to do. People have to come to this as a matter of their own conscience. But most of us feel that nature, including humanity, is a manifestation of the divine. That all life is sacred. That whatever the divine is, it's neither male nor the gods and goddesses are part of the divine. And that we're responsible for our own lives. That's a big one. And that we should live without harming others. Most of us are either pantheist or panentheist. And uh, you have a resident theologian who can go into that further later on if you like. But basically it's the idea that the divine, the holy, comes to us through everything. Uh, animist, that's when you believe everything is alive. Uh, polytheist, yes, we do believe, many of us, that there are multiple deities. Henotheism is a theological term that means that's fine, you've got your gods over there, these are mine here. 
And that's the way most of the world has lived throughout most of history as we know it. It's only been Abrahamic religions that have um, insisted that monotheism was the only way. So that is probably the most difficult thing to explain to people because we're all so acculturated. Our very science, our history, everything about our Western culture is based on this idea of monotheism and God is better than us. And that's not the pagan way of thinking, but it's very difficult to break out of that pattern. We do acknowledge principles of magic. Um, that's another lecture. <laughs> Pluralistic, that means there's all kinds of pagans out there. You know, I told you that my group is Egyptian-based, and that's really a tiny minority of the pagan world. Um, most people feel that personal experience or gnosis, which was a Greek, Greek word? Yeah, having to do with knowledge, um, feel that that's very important. Uh, we, you know, there's always this balance between uh, not completely sane and personal gnosis that you have to be careful uh, that you're not becoming totally delusional. But we do feel it's important to to listen to your heart. And we reference lots and lots of pre-Christian indigenous uh, mythologies and traditions. Basic practices, most of us get inspired by nature. We follow the seasons. If you hear people talk about uh, Astara or Samhain, uh, the equinoxes, the solstices, all of our uh, main holidays were based on some stuff that Gerald Gardner put into place. And they're the, the two equinoxes, the two solstices, and then uh, a holiday in between each of those. And I have found that even in Egypt, which is a, a whole different landscape from ours, people did actually have festivals that coincided with a lot of um, these seasons that we know in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, most of us hold ceremonies in a circle, not always. A lot of us call the four directions, and I think you do that here. Uh, we acknowledge elements of earth, air, fire, and water, and often spirit, uh, and not necessarily formal clergy, nor formal scripture. This is actually starting to be a little dated since I first um, put it together about 10 or 15 years ago, but um, this is the center, it says neo-paganism, just to differentiate from pre-Abrahamic um, indigenous paganisms. And there are all sorts. The Egyptian stuff would fall under what we call reconstruction. You've got a lot of people. Some people will say, well, I'm Wiccan. Uh, others will say, well, I'm a witch, but I'm not Wiccan. It, you know, it's banana banana. <laughs> Druidry, there's a lot of druids out there. Um, you have a hugely growing number of heathen, Norse, Slavic, East European pagan groups. Now, I do, I have to say here, it's important to understand that there are some of those which are caught up with white supremacist movements. And that's something that Cherry Hill Seminary has actually been trying to research and work on for a while. We've got a wonderful um, former student who started a group called Heathens Against Hate, um, men's movements, esoteric and ceremonial magic, those would be based on some movements that happened um, turn of the last century, like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Uh, they were sort of a blend of Christianity and mystical stuff. Dianic would be women's groups, and African diaspora, Latin American. Uh, I did not put Native American up here, but Native American, any of these indigenous groups that are currently active. You, we do a lot of talking in pagan circles about how to not appropriate other people's culture. And uh, that's important. However, there are plenty of uh, those groups around. Um, Andy told me one time that this looked like his board in Florida. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. So, why would anybody call themselves a witch? You know, I didn't start it, okay? Uh, there were people who wanted to reclaim the language of feminism once upon a time, and okay, that's fine. But what I learned is that witch means a healer, often somebody who is psychic or is working on developing that aspect of their abilities, a wise one, perhaps an herbalist, somebody who knows the, the ways of the world, close to the earth and season. And always in my world, we use power for good. If you hear somebody talk about white witchcraft and black witchcraft like good and bad, uh-uh, that's, that's Hollywood. There's no such thing. Um, so here are some people. Uh, this is a Japanese herbalist who I think calls herself a witch. This is a Native American. This fellow, I believe, is um, a witch doctor in uh, a South Pacific Island. Um, same here, Tamsin Blight. She was a famous English witch healer in the late 18th, early 19th century and supposed to be able to remove curses or spells. You'll steer, still run into uh, Hispanic people even here around town. I have been talking to people and said, do you mean you're a curandero? And they go, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, doesn't everybody know that? I worked for the Laotian immigrant group in North Carolina for several years. And even when we had some young women going on scholarship to Stanford, we were so proud of them and to think they were going for a health-related degree. And I said, do you think that this grant we're applying for that has to do with uh, trying to connect shaman, your shamans and um, services in the medical community, is this gonna be relevant as your older generation dies out? And they both looked at each other and they said, we're still really more comfortable going to the shaman first before we go to the doctor. So, uh, oh and bruja, that's another, bruja or brujo, that's another um, word. And you still have people that are referred to in the English countryside as cunning folk, a cunning woman or a cunning man. Yeah, this is a Hmong shaman. So what's Wicca? We're gonna skip through this quickly. Uh, but I could share this with you if you like later. It's just, a, it's like a denomination of paganism, it is initiatory. The coven is just the word, it, it's the same word that covenant comes from, it's, a, it's the community, and they usually are small because they're usually home groups. Um, it has been the most common pagan religion in the US, that is rapidly shifting because we have so many people coming along who are uh, getting interested in Northern European traditions. And I've put a lot of pictures in here because we tend to be so unknown and hidden and I wanted you to see these are real people. Um, this person, her father, she grew up with her father helping develop whatever was the, the last big movement in Judaism. I can never remember, it's not reformed, I don't think. But anyway, she grew up with theologians and people coming to her house. And, Famous people, very interesting woman. He's a psychotherapist. I think she's a mental health counselor. She was a therapist for many years. This is a military group on base. Uh, obviously, they're Wiccan. This is a couple in Las Vegas. They're both professional performers, so their music and ceremonies are really to die for. Um, I always look at this and think that's Ruth. <laughs> yeah, but this is a, a women's group. Actually, I think that's a Verdun group. Yes. Uh, this particular group has been around for more than 40 years now. They're in Western Mass, and they're very well known. Go ahead. This is something we do that people really like. Al, you and... Um, Carol? Yeah. 
um, might have been at some of our IPFC events when we do a spiral dance. Got to, those are spiral dances. In fact, the lady that was on the witch slide earlier, that's her in the middle. She's a close friend. Okay. Druidry. I'm still trying to figure that one out myself, although I have lots and lots of druid friends. So we'll keep going. This is um, our former arch druid of the ADF group, which is the largest in this country, and he's been doing prison ministry at this uh, Washington State Prison for about 15 years. There he is at his own ordination. We tease him and call this Gandalf. It's something about the fire, the light from the fire. And that's another group. Okay. Heathenry, people of the heath. Oh, we, we didn't say anything about where we got the word pagan. Well, it's the Latin word for people. And as the Roman Empire spread, the Paganus were the people. And then it became the, it's like saying somebody's a hick or a redneck. <laughs> they were the country people who still had their own gods instead of worshiping the cult of the emperor. Heathenry is, Ozatrus is one um, strand of heathenry. It, it's the national religion of Iceland. You're either Lutheran or you're Ozatru, and they're funded by the state over there. Yeah. Heathenry, yeah. People of the heath, people, yeah. So, and again, uh, we'll, we'll go on, but um, these are some heathens doing ceremonies. Okay. Some more heathen ceremonies. They do pass around drinks in a horn. <laughs> Dianic usually is looking to the lunar cycle compared to women's bodies and that as a framework for understanding your spirituality. This is the um, Sekhmet Temple of the Goddess and way out in the desert, out, uh, northwest of uh, Las Vegas. And I have about three friends who are priestesses ordained through that temple. That's another story. This is in Glastonbury at an annual women's uh, big do there. You can tell they're Dianic. Uh, they're all wearing red. Uh, this is a lady with a goddess temple in uh, LA. Got quite the following. Oh, that's the Glastonbury thing again. These banners, by the way, were all on display at the Parliament in Salt Lake City. They were beautiful. Just a few altars here. So you see, people just build their own and decide what to put there. That's another conversation. Go ahead. Men's movements, you might have heard of radical fairies. There's a Minoan Brotherhood. Sometimes people just say gay witchcraft or Dionysian tradition, Temple of Antinous. I think Harry Hay may be in this picture. <laughs> it's old, okay? okay. Reconstructionists. Um, I think this may be one, two, three, four, five. This may be Hellenic Greek uh, reconstruction. This, of course, would be Kemetic Egyptian. This looks strikingly like stuff we're seeing coming out of Ukraine, doesn't it? So, you know, we've got Nova Roma, New Roman, um, or Religio Romana. There are a lot of things I'm not even familiar with. There's somebody who's pretty prominent in Minnesota who calls himself a Jew witch, and he does go and blow the shofar at, uh, on Yom Kippur for local synagogues. He gets paid to come in and do that. Yeah, okay. So here's some Hellenics. These are um, Roman, Roma, and uh, this is um, a shot from a movie and it took them years. They lobbied the 
uh, Greek government, and it was very, very difficult. In Greece, it was, you had to be either Greek Orthodox or Jewish or maybe Muslim, and they wouldn't recognize any other religion, which had some legal implications for people. So it took them about 20 years, but they finally became recognized. So this is a little movie you can find online for free now called We Still Worship Zeus. Uh, these are some kind of kinetics. There's somebody. This is me with my hands in a bowl of ice water in early August. We were about to die. We're out in that park, Justin. Were you there the time the mosquitoes were so bad? Yes, but that. Yeah, but the the water, the rose water and ice water was nice, wasn't it? We would bless ourselves and wash our hands in it. More of the Roma guys. And here by Roma, I don't mean what used to be referred to as gypsies. I'm talking about Roman. African diaspora. There's a, a pretty significant movement of voodoo, or, or voodoo in this country. And a lot of, um, I would say at least half are probably white. So it's, it's not even an ethnic thing anymore. It's a religion. Santeria is common, places like Cuba, Candomblé, out of Brazil. Um, root work, anybody heard of root workers here? Yep, yep. Uh, that's another whole conversation. That's fascinating, that's fascinating. That is specifically the um, Gulf Coast, just at the coast, and the South Carolina, Georgia coast. Am I right? Those of you who were laughing, yeah. That's, that's the only place in the country that you, you'll hear people referred to as root workers. Okay. This is me on Jackson Square in New Orleans having my bones blown and my palm read. This is a, an antique painting of the African goddess Yemaya, which I took in the Voodoo Museum in New Orleans. I don't get the snake. Okay, I don't know anything about snakes. <laughs> but you can see you got these cute little white girls lined up to do their voodoo initiation. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, it's actually Haiti. It's Haiti. And it's and a lot of people will tell you that voodoo is Christian because it is kind of like an overlay of indigenous and Catholic. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, definitely a blend. Okay. So these were, uh, you'll um, encounter esoteric, ceremonial, magical groups. Um, they may refer to themselves as Thelemic or Golden Dawn. Um, there are groups that, OTO, there are groups that, um, I've got a student I'm mentoring right now, and I didn't know what to think when he first came to me. He said he was Satanist. Well, yeah, there's a big distinction between the Satanists that came along in uh, Berkeley in the 60s, and that guy, he was just, he was a carnival barker. He literally, that was what he had done. So their, their intent is to shock the world, but there is a strain of people that sometimes turn up in pagan contexts who are really more agnostic and strong belief in personal transformation. And this fellow has turned out to be wonderful. He's, he's really taken the idea of ministry to heart. Here's a, a thalamic ceremony. See how they've got a lot of Egyptian looking stuff. That's definitely that Golden Dawn influence. Uh, sometimes I mention that people have lots of different ways of knowing. Dowson. Um, tarot. These are just props for tapping into your inner intuition. When is a star a pinnacle? Well, I got to tell you, these are all over Washington and they're all over our flag because it is a sacred symbol dating back to the Greeks, right? Pythagoras, all of that. It's just. Uh, it's the equal distance between five points in a circle. 
And if you draw a straight line here, you end up with, guess what, a pentagon. Um, so it's really just a symbolic, um, it's a symbol. It's a symbol to which you can attach whatever um, meaning you want. Some people will trace that as they open up uh, a circle or um, as they're doing a meditation. Some of them will s think of each point as representing an area of their, their person that they need to work on. More sacred geometry, Fibonacci spiral, flower of life, yeah, there's some more. Okay. We mentioned the wheel of the year. There are, of course, moon cycles, and some people are really religiously follow the moon. I personally am a spoiled Westerner who's too conditioned to our, is it Gregorian calendar? Yeah, uh, so I, I just can't keep up with the moon stuff, but most people would think of that as blasphemy in my world. <laughs> okay. These are the names of the different holidays in Whip and Circle. I took these pictures. This guy is, has been in Columbia a couple of times. Were you all at the Gathering of Fates we did at the uh, Convention Center? You might remember him. Anyway, he's a sweetheart. He's, um, it's the guy with the antlers, Mike. No, no, it wasn't that. It was something Interfaith Partners did. But um, anyway, you can go to the next one. Because we can. And the heavy influence of counterculture. There's my witchy friend again. So that's it. 18 chill. So, so what questions do you have, if any? I looked it up a couple of years ago. It, it's, but it, it is a landscape thing. Yeah, the people of the heath. It's like, it's just like saying the people of the country, the countryside. Yeah. So since we're since we're broadcasting and, y and the broadcast can't hear that, I, when you ask a question, I'll repeat it so so the folks on our broadcast can hear. Where's my, yeah. Uh, uh, Justin had asked about the heath, and that was the, the answer there. Rosemary? Yeah, I mean, you talked about um, for spiritual training, you know, people in the knowledge of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So what sort of is spiritual training for everyone in the spiritual path? Or is it, you know, directly to that? Like how are you guys kind of, I'm interested in how that works. So the question is about uh, Cherry Hill Seminary, and you have, you showed us a lot of different uh, things that fall under right. paganism. So how, how do you bring all of them together under one roof. Right. <laughs> we, well, for one thing, a seminary does not teach you what to believe. It pushes you and challenges you to explore what you believe and work on your uh, sense of ethics and uh, principles. But a seminary assumes that you, you are there because you have a religion. So we don't try to replace that, but people do find that they do quite a lot of spiritual exploration with us. As an example, the Lutheran Seminary here, the uh, woman who served as their interim president for a couple of years while they were doing a surge was a Southern Baptist. And there are people there from lots of different religions. Yeah, they're not all Lutheran. Yeah, they weren't all Methodist at my seminary, so <laughs> I sure yeah. wasn't. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I went to a Methodist seminary. I went to the Canler yeah. School of Theology at Emory University, and there was a very diverse uh, breadth of of representative. There were pagans there. There were there were atheists. Yeah. There were you know, they, it did, and they they wanted to come to seminary. <laughs> so, yeah, people go to seminary for all sorts of different 
different reasons, um, but seminary, uh, for me, in my experience, it kind of tears you, it's like military, it kind of tears you down to build you back up. Because <laughs> it, it exposes you to, to new new and interesting things, and woo, once you once, once I learned the history of Christianity, I, I said, this is like hamburger. It's delicious, but you don't want to see how it got made. <laughs> it's messy. <laughs> well, some of what I've said tonight would have that effect on people who make assumptions about paganism. Yeah. Like that it's this prehistoric religion that's come down to us over millennia. Yeah. I, oh. Yes. Okay, so the question about it is about ordination. So when you are ordained, what are you ordained as if there's no clear clergy or hierarchies yeah. or denominations? Good question. <laughs> there is a tradition of priesthood in most pagan traditions, and uh, there is specific training for that, uh, for example, in Wicca. But they don't necessarily get the kind of background that people do in a modern seminary. So at any rate, my group, since we had invented ourselves, we didn't have a tradition that said this is what we've always done. And there came a point, particularly with my involvement with Interfaith Partners, that I, I remember Clyde telling the group one night, you know, Holly would really appreciate it if y'all would consider ordaining her. Well, ordination is kind of like a stamp of approval. It's saying this person is part of our group and we know her and we trust her and, you know, we, we choose to convey this to her. Like, I bet you were not ordained until you were placed in the first congregation. That's the way some denominations do it. I was ordained in an independent church that didn't, that it wasn't part of an, a denomination. And then, um, then when I did join a denomination, the United Church of Christ, um, they had to approve, they had to recognize my ordination. Yeah. And that was a whole process. Yeah. <laughs> Even the Unitarians do that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I do want to share with y'all while ahead. we're still together that Interfaith Partners was, has been just a beautiful journey for me. And I often tell my own students at the seminary, you know, when pagans first have the door opened and they're invited to be part of an interfaith group or somehow they knock the door down enough <laughs> to get in. <laughs> You know, they think, oh, good, I'm a minority. And, you know, I bet half the people in this room represent some sort of minority. Am I right? Mm. Religious, ethnic, gender, something. So you understand what it feels like to be seen mm. and to be recognized for what you are. Right. So a lot of pagans will get into interfaith activities because it's like, oh, cool, they're going to find out we don't burn babies in the backyard, <laughs> we don't worship Satan, you know. <laughs> and then after a while they go, well, this is cool. Oh, I'm learning about other religions too. This is stuff I didn't know. And I couldn't have learned it from reading a book. Yeah. Trust me, getting to know Muslim women will give you a whole different picture of Islam, for example. And uh, then after a while, when we had the Syrian refugee crisis and, and Interfaith Partners held a press conference up at the State House, and I can still remember looking at the reporters, and you can appreciate this with mm. your journalism background, <laughs> yeah. and saying, you know, this is, there's a lot of bored young people not getting paid enough to stand around and take notes and run the cameras so yeah. that somebody can mix it when they go back to the, uh, to the studio. And I looked at him and I said, you know, this is not a woo-woo thing anymore. This is not about kumbaya. This could save our lives someday. And I remember everything was so on the edge then, kind of like it is now. Mm -hmm. And I remember their eyes all got really big and some of them were nodding. And after that, the TV stations around here started paying interfaith partners a lot more attention. So I want to encourage you that whether you just find it interesting to go to a program or you want to make new friends, or you want to find out about people that are different from you, any of those is a valid reason to pop into something. And what you'll find out is th this area, not just South Carolina, but even here in the Midlands, is so much more diverse than you realize. We have five mosques here. Mm -hmm. Five. 
There are people I teach who don't even know if there are any Muslims where they live. The mayor of Irmo a few years ago famously said, I didn't know there were any Muslims in Irmo. <laughs> well, there is that. I won't repeat what Justin said. Well, and there are Buddhist temples and yeah, Hindu more than temples. Once. <laughs> yes. Sikh, yeah. yes. Baha'is. There are, there's a Hindu temple around the corner from me. It's, it's definitely a smaller subgroup of Hinduism, but that's at least two within what, Clyde, 10 minutes of our house. Mm. So, I, and then there are Scientologists. There are um, all kinds of uh, different small groups that I don't even know the name of. <laughs> and, uh, and, but then the largest and fastest growing group, of course, is the unaffiliated. The nuns. Yep. Yeah. That doesn't mean they don't believe anything. Right. And it doesn't mean they don't want to be in a group. Some of them really just don't want to be tied down, but they still have spiritual needs. Absolutely. So they're glad for you to be their friend and to know they can come here if they want to. Right. That's my speech. All right. I, get I like that talk. speech. Mara? I think people become unaffiliated because of there was a trauma. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mara there said that people become affiliated, unaffiliated because of, of trauma, and that's, that is true. That's very frequently the case. We, we do a fair amount at Cherry Hill Seminary of helping our students get past that and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to kind of lay the law down last year with one of mine and say, you know, all Christians are not like the people you grew up with. Mm. Yeah. Todd? I'm just going to repeat your question when you get to it. <laughs> We're getting a Todd talk. <laughs> Okay, so the, so the so the <laughs> the question, if I can if I can compress all that, <laughs> um, uh, Todd is is talking about how he came from a, a more Christian background, went into Wicca, and now is at Jubilee, which is we don't know what, but <laughs> and um, and how and, and uh, on a similar path as mm -hmm. yourself, and how and how you have integrated that. So speak to that a little bit, and also. Um, that, that Wicca uh, and paganism is very concerned with the earth and very concerned with the care of the earth. Um, and we don't see that a lot in Christian denominations. We don't see a lot of earth care. Some, some to be fair, are doing it, but not, there's not been a big thrust within the larger Christian movement for that. So um, do the pagans offer us some hope that we, can, that we can bring that again to the forefront? Oh, I, th I think so, Todd. And you're right, it's a journey of integration. I'm glad you see it that way. And not everybody is gonna make a journey like mine or yours. And not everybody's gonna come out on the other side integrated, shall we say. But as far as um, environmental concerns, yeah, I think the Christian world is waking up. It's just that the voices who would represent that kind of sensibility are often drowned out by a different type of rhetoric. Well, my, my question I guess is about the water discourse. It's like people seem to be really good at, at deciding the way people relate with each other, mm -hmm. but I don't think they have the language for uh, how we relate to the earth. Remember what I said about um, c 
considering all life to be sacred, I think rocks are sacred. Mm -hmm. I think they have their own kind of sentience. It's not human. They're on their own journey. How many of you have always kind of felt like the trees were there for you? Yeah. And, and I love yeah. rocks. I'm a big fan of rocks. <laughs> yeah. So now not everybody feels that way. Right. But as long as we separate ourselves out into humans and everything else, I think we'll feel like it's okay for us to call the shots. And, you know, one of my uh, friends told me something many years before I figured out I was pagan. I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he just laughed at me. He was a big nat naturalist also. And he said, it doesn't matter what we do. Mother Earth is going to win in the mm. end. Right, even if she has to shake us off. Yep. <laughs> um, what I just wanted to mention is not only Christianity, Islam is not there too. They do not have that connection with the planet. And I mean, the times I went to church on Mother Earth, we had the little prayer, thank God for the water. Looking for the water to get you here. Thank God for the moon. You know, don't say we use the word moon. But when it's time to grow them crops and they want fruit, they don't use the moon. So we don't hear them talk about the skies. We don't hear them talk about any of that. And we need all of that because we're a part of the earth as well. If you never hear them use those words, not even on school trips. I saw a beautiful meme, and maybe I, I, I'll close with this, okay. that I posted today for Earth Day. It's just a gorgeous landscape. It looks like it might be the Heath, Justin. But... <laughs> It's very soulful, and the caption said, the earth always knows us, even when we've lost our way. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, well, um, so uh, if there's more questions in the room, uh, we'll take those uh, in just a moment, but um, we're going to try to keep this on uh, YouTube to an hour, so uh, we uh, thank you so much for joining us out there um, on YouTube for our live stream, and you'll be able to watch this again uh, as in its recorded version. And thank you so much for everyone for joining us in the room. We really appreciate you coming out to our first of hopefully many uh, conversations, Jubilee Circle in conversation. And um, so as, as always, Everyone who is watching is certainly welcome to come to Jubilee Circle. Uh, we are at 6729 Two Notch Road here in Columbia, South Carolina, or you can watch us from anywhere you are on the YouTube um, on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. And how do people get involved with the interfaith, uh, the, with the interfaith folks here in Columbia? I, I'm going to give you an easy way to reach me. My email <laughs> is on that flyer that's okay. going around. And you can ping me. Can you say it out loud for the people? CHS at cherryhillseminary.org. Okay. It's long, but it makes sense. <laughs> no special spellings. And then for Interfaith Partners, if you want to visit the website, there's a great website, interfaithpartnersofsc.org. Okay. Good. And, and they meet on Zoom, and you, you can learn all sorts of interesting things about um, all of the interfaith partners here in South Carolina. And um, it's, a, it's a great group of people, and you can make friends. And are you guys ever going to go back out, out and eat again? <laughs> well, we'd love to. We're talking about <laughs> how, what to do next. Uh, we've decided that um, we like the online format mm. so that people who don't like to drive at night well, sure. or live yeah. too far away can come. Yeah. So we may go to having a restaurant and a virtual. Yeah. Well, there's always hybrid like we're doing right now. So yeah. you can, you can, you can right. do a little of both. We learned a lot of things during COVID. <laughs> but thank you for joining us this evening. Again, I'm Reverend Candace Shalou, and this has been Holly Emore, and we thank you so much for being with us tonight, Holly. Thank you, everybody. All right. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>